Hey guys, Adam Trigger here, wagertalk.com. It's time for another conference tournament preview. Today we're heading south. We're going to the Southern Conference, uh, better known as the SoCon, I would say. That's pretty much what everyone calls it. And um, I'm going to bring in my friend Nick. You guys probably know him on Twitter as Turnstone Capper, uh, but his name is Nick Greeley, and he's joining me today. So Nick, welcome in, and uh, just introduce yourself, because I don't know if the Wager Talk audience has, has met you before. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, and we'll get right into breaking down the SoCon. Yeah, I appreciate you having me on today, Adam. Uh, it's my first time on a Wager Talk, so uh, appreciate you guys welcoming me on board today to break down the SoCon. Um, if you're new, if you've never met me, never heard of me, uh, my Twitter is at Turnstone Capper. I have been uh, betting on basketball and been in the space since uh, 2019, so a uh, good few years now. Well, it was awesome to meet you in person earlier this year. Uh, got to meet up with you in Raleigh at NC State Virginia Tech. Part of probably my favorite part, well, one of my favorite things about getting to go to like different gyms and, and going so many different places is, is kind of the impromptu, you know, getting to meet the people that I've been friends with on this on the Twitter app for, for a very long time. So that was really cool uh, to meet you in person and now, um, you know, get to talk about SoCon basketball with you. So real quick, we'll let the viewers know. Harris Cherokee Center, Asheville, North Carolina. Hasn't changed in forever. I, I mean, this this tournament's been in, in Asheville for, God, probably over 15, you know, maybe at least 15 years at this point. And um, no real, you know, gimmicks or, or strange wrinkles here. Just your 10-team SoCon, traditional tournament. You've got a first round on Friday with seven playing 10, eight playing nine, and then it's just a traditional bracket format, uh, you know, they're on out all the way through the title game on Monday. Um, so let's just start. We'll get right into it with Friday's games. So we know the matchups on Friday. Uh, and, and, you know, that's kind of how I've been doing these. We'll, we'll, we'll talk through the teams, but we'll do it, you know, as they sort of pop up. Uh, so on Friday, we're going to see the, the bottom four. And I think that's sort of important to point out here. The top five teams in this league are really good. Like you're, we're going to get into these, and there are some. There are some really good teams in this league. The fact that Furman is the five seed just speaks to the depth at the top of this league. Wofford, kind of in you know a little bit of a transitional period for for their program. They're the six, and then I would say there's a pretty big drop off from seven to ten. Now we'll talk about the seven, ten, eight, nine matchups here. Let's start with the first one. It's going to be the eight versus the nine, Mercer Citadel. Um, my thought here when I saw that this was the game was Citadel's going to be catching too many points. The reason I kind of came up with that is Mercer finished the year on fire. I believe they went four and one to close out the regular season. Some really nice, like actually really crazy results in there too. I believe they had a win over Samford, uh, beat Furman, beat Greensboro. So they were getting wins over like the top teams in this league, which is super impressive. Um, but my power rating doesn't have them that far off from Citadel. So I'm curious here if the books are going to hang a number that, that makes Citadel somewhat of a play. But, man, I don't know if I want to back this Citadel team because they've been sort of a fade for me lately. So do you have any thoughts here, and, and how are you kind of seeing this first matchup? Yeah, you know, uh, Mercer is, like you said, there is a drop-off, uh, especially when you get that 7 range, 7 to 10. Um, there is a big drop-off in play and quality. I will say Mercer has been trending in the right direction. You kind of hit on it. They're four and one their last five. Uh, Jalen McCrary is a really good player and at his best. You know he's a twenty point uh, scorer in the SoCon, so he's tough. He's gonna be the best player in the game for sure. Um, the Citadel hasn't been great as of recently. Um, Mercer actually, I think they, I believe they just beat Mercer not that long ago. I think they split one on one in the regular season. Um, like you said, though, I have a power rated pretty similarly. Um, I make this game like under possession. If it's over possession, I'd look to back to Citadel. But um, if it's like a pick em or, or you're just laying one, I would have to go with Mercer. They're, just, they're the better team. They're a hot team. They're the best player on a neutral. I think Mercer gets it done. Yeah, it's going to be all about the number here because, again, it's it's more or less like I don't think we'll get the right value on Mercer just based on their recent run. Like people are going to gonna pull up the – standings that probably haven't bet the SoCon all year and say, oh, Mercer's playing great. They beat the better teams. I think the books are going to shade to that. I think they're going to price that in. So it'll really be more or less, can we make a case for Citadel, who 
you know, they're three and 15 in the league, but one of their wins was, it was a home win over Mercer. And, you know, they, yeah, they lost the other day to Mercer. Oh, not maybe a couple weeks ago, but it was a, a relatively competitive game. Uh, I believe Mercer ended up winning that game by nine. Um, so that, that'll be the interesting thing there is, is, you know, can I, can I make a case or be comfortable enough back in the Citadel, a team that I've been more interested in playing against? I don't know. And, and I'll kind of have to wait to see what the, the market does and, and what kind of number these books hang um, to, to see if it's even worth trying to make a case for Citadel. Now, if Mercer survives this game, they will play the one seed Samford. Nick, I remember the, the game we went to, Virginia Tech, NC State, um, was early. It was a noon tip. Uh, I was with our, our our buddy AK, um, who, you know, we were at the game. And then him and I got in the car. We actually went to Greensboro to watch Greensboro Wofford. And the entire way, we talked about taking Mercer against Samford. I think they were a pretty big um, underdog in that game. And ultimately, we didn't do it. Ultimately, they covered on the road, 87-80. And then they turn around on February 17th, just a couple weeks ago, and, and hand Samford a loss on their home floor, 88-84. As we said, one of the, the great results that Mercer's had of late. So assuming this is Mercer Citadel, or I'm sorry, assuming this is Mercer Samford, can Mercer put a scare into the one seed in this tournament? I truly do think they can put a scare into them. I don't think they have enough to win this game outright. Uh, but, you know, we should be catching a pretty good number here. Uh, you know, a number that I, I for sure think Mercer can hang around a cover, no doubt. Yeah, I think the concern here and, and is now, you know, Samford's got like, the, the way they play with the pace that they play. And then of course the, the depth on that roster and the fact that they should be healthier than they've been in recent weeks. You might have to like really watch that Mercer Citadel game and, and see what kind of effort Mercer exerts in that game. I mean, if it's like a crazy game that goes to OT or if it's like a super like physical type game that Mercer really just leaves it all out there, can they turn around and have any chance against the one seed the following day? I think that's the question that you need to ask yourself. But if it's a relatively, if it's a walk in the park against Citadel, Mercer has shown the ability to handle Samford's style of play across the two matchups. And, and like you said, you're probably going to be catching a big number there. So that's one that I'd, I'd at least have to see if I could make a case for Mercer based against the number based on the way that they've played Samford so far uh, on two occasions this season. Um, I'll slide over to the other game. Now, this is where you want to talk about a drop off. I would say VMI was, was probably far worse than anyone else in this conference this year. Certainly Ken Palm thinks so. I mean, you know, all of the, the one thing I think you can talk about in general about this league, there are some really good offensive teams in this league. Uh, VMI is not one of them. 359th in Ken Palm adjusted offensive efficiency. And then their defense 269th, it's the worst mark in the league. But one thing East Tennessee doesn't do well is put the ball in the basket. They're a team that like probably does everything else pretty good, really good athletes. They, they, they play defense, they block shots, they rebound, but they don't always put the ball in the hoop. Offensive metrics for them are really poor. So is there any world where VMI knocks off East Tennessee State in the 7-10, or is East Tennessee State going to cruise by them? Yeah, you kind of hit it, you know, the nail on the head there by saying, you know, VMI is by far the worst team in the league. I mean, they're bad. I, I think they're going to have a lot of guys transfer at the portal. I think their head coach might be gone as well. You know, the season is pretty much all but over. They just have this game and it's it's wraps. I don't see them pulling off, you know, any type of upset. It'd be monumental, honestly. Um, but like you said, ETSU is ninth in the league at offense. Uh, so, you know, second to worst just in front of VMI. Uh, you really got to worry about how much margin they have. Um, I'm expecting like a, you know, probably like a 15 point spread on this one, something around there. Um, you know, they know they can win this game. They've already beaten VMI twice, even though they only won by one on the road. It was, it was probably a game they didn't really care about that much. They knew they could win. The other game they put up 82, they won by 13. Um, you know, this is another game they know they can win. So uh, they, they might get caught looking ahead uh, to uh, uh, UNCG, but honestly, I doubt it. They should be able to breeze through this game. Yeah, and it's, it's worth noting that E ETSU really cleaned up against the bottom part of this league this year. Like they won all like they won every game that they were supposed to win for the most part. Like 
against the the bottom tier teams in this league. Um, didn't beat one of the top four until over the weekend. And I'm going to vent about that one in a second because I was on the wrong side of it. But just to wrap up this opening round, yeah, I, I would say like if you're looking at a spread bet here, you, you're almost guaranteed – to be laying a premium with East Tennessee, I would probably, it would have to be VMI plus the points are pass for me, just from where I have a feeling that they're going to price this. Um, I think they're going to make you lay way too many than you should uh, with East Tennessee. Uh, and, and again, with their offense being what it is, I don't know if I would, would trust them to cover a big number. Now, I got a vent for a second. I had Greensboro over the weekend. They played East Tennessee State. It was in Johnson City. So it was in, you know, at East Tennessee um, and it was a game where I felt like UNC Greensboro played as bad as they possibly could have. They played terrible and still found themselves with a four point lead with a minute left, managed to give up a three and then lose the game at the buzzer. Um, this is, this is important because if East Tennessee wins the opening round, that's who they're playing. It's a rematch against Greensboro and no, just kind of knowing everything that went on in that game. Mikel Browns Jones had three fouls in the first half. He was called for like a ridiculous, um, like offensive foul. It was it was some sort of weird foul that probably shouldn't have gone against him. That kind of took him out of this game. Um, UNCG is a pretty solid three point shooting team. If you look at their conference only metrics, three point percentage forty one point six percent is number one in the league. They could not hit water if they fell out of a boat in that game for a lot of the game. They just missed every shot uh, and still found themselves up four and then managed to choke the game away. Nick, if this is the rematch, UNCG East Tennessee, I think Greensboro gets them back. I, I don't see any way that East Tennessee has enough firepower to get by Greensboro in the 7-2 game. Uh, yeah, for sure. I 100% I agree with that. And, you know, the last game um, – I want to put a whole lot of stock into that. You know, there's a lot of seating implications going on um, in the SoCon. I, I mean, I know, for instance, you know, Chattanooga was resting Trey Bonham, and them losing was honestly the best case for them, you know, losing the Western Carolina with how it all shook out. So there's a lot going on in that game. Um, you know, I'd probably make the line UNCG around, you know, laying five versus ETSU. I'd, I'd lay the number. Um, they were up 16, and they won, the one, they won the first game by 16, was up 21. ETSU never led. That's why I don't put a whole lot into them, you know, losing by one. Like you said, they had their chances last game at ETSU. You know, I just don't know if their motivation was, you know, fully there. Um, but, yeah, I'd make it, like, around five for the, for the following game. And I do think it'll be ETSU, UNCG, and I would lay it with UNCG. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to want to lay just to, as long as I'm not laying, like, an obnoxious number there. Uh, you know, like, I'm almost hoping for, like, a really convincing ETSU win in the first round to maybe water that number down a little bit, because I do think people are going to see the fact that ETSU just beat them. Um, but man, like I'm, I, I would lay probably up to that. I think UNCG probably runs them out just with, just with their ability to shoot the three and the fact that they could not make one um, in, in, you know, for like a long stretch of that game, I think gives them a kind of a nice edge there. Now the game of, of the, the quarterfinal round, and it's actually kind of wild that this is a quarterfinal game, is Furman and Western Carolina. Um, it certainly feels like there's five teams that could really have a, a very, very strong chance to win this tournament. And, and shockingly, Nick, Furman is the five seed. Now, we had a graphic that had tournament-long odds up. I think they're 7-1 to one to win this tournament. I mean, I don't know if they get past Western Carolina because that's a fantastic matchup and a fantastic game. But I think if you're taking a conference future here, Nick, Furman seven to one seems like the best bet on the board right now. So talk to me if you agree, and if you've got a take in this matchup, Furman Western Carolina. Yeah, for sure. You know, if we're talking about teams of upside, a team who, who's been there, coaches who've been there. You know, Bob Ritchie, uh, Furman has all the upside. They have talent. They can go deep, one through ten, really. Uh, JP Pegues, I mean, he is March. If you remember, he had the shot versus Virginia last year and sent him to the round of thirty-two. I mean, this this team's really good. Hey, they have, they battled the injured the injured bug, you know, basically all season. Alex Williams was was suspended for a few games, but you know they're they're another full strength there. They're that full team here. You know, all the upsides with them really. Um, so for a long shot future, I think they're 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 the team. However, you know, game one, like you said, they have to play Western Carolina. You know, that is no easy task. Ontarius Woolbright is, you know, if I was making a comparison to the NBA. You know, I'd probably compare him to Luka Dalkic. The ball's always in his hands. He's really good in the mid-range, uh, back-you-down type of game. 
you know, he's pretty much on the verge of averaging a triple double this whole season in, in, in SoCon play. Um, so he's elite. Um, you know, that game is going to be f- very tough. And, and this is my biggest thing with this game is it's going to be a war. It's going to be a battle. You know, if you get Sanford, you know, probably play Sanford the next game, assuming, you know, they beat Mercer pretty bad with the, with the depth they have. Sanford would be so much more fresh, and that's the worry. It's just that, that Western Carolina Herbert beats themselves up, and he eliminates any value for a long shot play on either of these teams winning it, and you just catch Sanford at a bad time. Yeah, I mean, I have a bit, I have a feeling the reason, Furman, you're going to get 7-1 to one is, is in theory you're going to have to go through Western Carolina, Sanford, and then, like, you know, whoever wins the other side of the of the bracket right there, which is, it, it is no easy task. Now, um, from... I do think Western Carolina is going to be favored here. Like the, the metrics really like this team. I, I know like a lot of the analytics have Western Carolina as like the second best team in this league. They're of course the four seed. So you can look at that as like one of a couple ways, in my opinion, like they may be undervalued, under at the four, but at the same time, like, I, I don't know if I'm going to lay three, you know, two, three, whatever it might be on a neutral against Furman. And especially you made a really good point. Alex Williams was suspended. And even though he's been back, he, he really hasn't been fully back. Like they haven't really played, like I, he, they haven't really played him that much. I don't think he's had more than five or six points in a game since he's come back. And I wonder if that has something to do with, you know, the suspension or like whatever, they weren't like super meaningful games, but you'd have to think he's back to playing his normal, normal minutes um, in, in a game like this. And so maybe there's a little bit of hidden, like hidden value there like line value with Furman, especially if they, they open them up an underdog. Yeah, I can't imagine this being around a possession, honestly. I'd actually make this a pick em. And, uh, you know, that, yeah. that's where you know, I should be. Uh, but plus three, it'd be Furman or pass 100%. Oh, yeah, that would get that would, that would would get hit really quickly. Um, uh, but, I, again, I could I could see, based on just what the, the analytics say, that, like, this could be one of those ones where – you know, Western Carolina is at like minus one, minus one and a half. And then the, the, I guess the sharper market will decide which, which way that line moves, but it's, it's certainly where I could see it opening. Uh, other, other semifinal. So the, the, the final quarterfinal, I'm sorry, the final quarterfinal, two teams we haven't talked about yet. Uh, Chattanooga and Wofford. Wofford is a team I got to see play against Greensboro like this. It, they're an interesting team because they do shoot it well, but they give up a ton of open three or open looks like they're not they're they're not great defensively uh the game i went to and saw you know unc greensboro play against them i mean they just gave up open three after open three greensboro ran them out wasn't even close um you know right now in conference only defense wofford is near the bottom like they're eighth in defensive efficiency per ken palm conference specific they're ninth in steal percentage ninth in block percentage ninth in turnover percentage like this isn't a very good defensive team can but but chattanooga at times can be a little bit inconsistent offensively so it's an interesting matchup because wofford can get hot they can shoot it and i'm wondering if they're ripe to pull an upset here i I don't like chattanooga's been way better than i expected uh but i don't know if this is the best matchup for them and i'm pretty sure chattanooga got the two regular season meetings so maybe wofford you know, gets him when it counts here. I don't know. I, this is a tough matchup. What do you think? Yeah, this is the first one we're really kind of on a different on a, on a different page. Um, you know, Dan Earl's a great coach. What he did with VMI was super impressive. He definitely earned the Chattanooga job. They, they made the SoCon championship out of nowhere last year. Um, and, and this year they're they're in a good position at the 3C spot. Um, Wofford is good, but uh, they don't match up particularly great with Chattanooga. Uh, Chattanooga controlled both games they play. They won by 16 of 14. Uh, that's pretty concerning, uh, getting blown out of Chattanooga like that. Um, I'd make this game around two, uh, Chattanooga being the favorite. And uh, I'd look to lay with Chattanooga. I'm, I'm just not a big believer in Wofford. Outside of Corey Tripp, I just don't think they have that much to offer. Yeah, I, I agree with that statement. I haven't been super high on Wofford this year. I guess I'm just acknowledging their ability to like throw up an outlier result because of, of the way they can, can shoot it at times. But you, you made a good point. Chattanooga, um, they, they, their offense rates out pretty much behind Samford as the top one in the league. Uh, and that's all Earl because I think what was it Stevens that was, was lost from this team last year. And then, and I mean, they haven't, 
they haven't really missed a beat. Like they they've looked awesome, um, you know, on offense. It's the defense with Chattanooga that's that's really kind of held them back as as you know, 227th adjusted defense per Ken Palm. It's uh one of the it's the worst mark by far of the top five, right? So if you're talking Sanford, Greensboro, Chattanooga, Western Carolina, Furman's kind of teetering on that, but we'll give Furman a little bit of a pass since they did have some injuries for stretches. Uh, Chattanooga defensively rates out sort of at the bottom of, of that like top group. So, you know, you start to, we, we kind of, the, the goal here was to kind of get through the bracket. Um, you know, the semifinal matchups, it's not even really worth going into matchups because it, anything could happen. And, and the, you know, I know for me, like it would vary significantly based on like who gets through that Furman Western Carolina game. Like, for example, Furman, I think they match up really nicely with Samford. Like they, they probably should have beat Samford twice this year. And, um, you know, that would be a game where if it's Furman, I, I may want to take a shot against Samford. But then Western Carolina, they, they seem to find a way to lose a lot of these close games. So it, it's just like the matchups are, are are what they are, and we'll have to take them as they come. Do you have like a, a, a play you're going to target, whether it be a first-round play or like a, a full tournament bet that you kind of like more than the others at this point? Yeah, so <clears throat> I have circled UNCG uh, versus Chattanooga in the semis. I really think we get that matchup, and I, and I really want to back UNC, UNCG in that. I make them a short favorite. Um, you know, to me, as a sleeper, I, I like UNCG around plus 425, plus 450. I think that's a great price. And, and you're avoiding, you know, Chattanooga is ranked third, but I don't think they're the third best. You might, I think Firm and Western Carolina um, and Sanford are, are, are the three other really good teams in the league. Uh, so, you know, I love the matchup with Chattanooga. I love their path. And uh, if they get to the championship, hypothetically, you know, I, it'll, be, it'll either be Western Carolina, Furman, or Sanford. Uh, they swept Furman, and they and they swept Western Carolina this year, 2-0 and straight up in both those games, so they match up great. Um, the one I'd be worried about, and the one that's likely to happen is Sanford. They're 0-2. Um, they just, you know, they don't match up great with them, but at plus 425, plus 450, you have a great ticket to hedge if you want in that title game. Um, so that's what I'm looking to do. I place a future on USCG to win the SoCon. Um, I like Mike Jones. Even though he's 0-2 in SoCon with USCG, uh, I, I really like his team this year. And, uh, you know, Bucky McMillan, does, Bucky McMillan doesn't have a great track record either. Sanford on, on a neutral. Um, and on a neutral court, UNCG is 3-0 this season. And Sanford hasn't played a game on a neutral court this year. So there's that as well. Well, you certainly kind of pointed out, I, I would agree with you that UNC Greensboro has a very manageable path. Like, in theory, in theory like, it's not that they're easy games on paper, but they're going to have – they're likely going to play East Tennessee in a revenge spot from a game they probably should have won, you know, last week. Uh, and then you you targeted the Greensboro Chattanooga matchup, where you know we talked about Chattanooga being the outlier sort of defensively of the top teams, and UNC Greensboro being the number one three point shooting team in the conference. So you know, all the while you've got um, Furman, Western Carolina, and Sanford beating up on each other on the other side of the bracket. So I, I totally see where you're coming from there. And yeah, I mean, when you, when you look at it like that, that, that does make a lot of sense. And that is a nice price. So, uh, you know, maybe we'll see the Spartans in the final. Uh, but what I do know, Nick is it should be an awesome tournament. I can't wait to watch the SoCon play this weekend. Uh, thank you so much for joining. And, and once, you know, one last time, tell the viewers where they can find you and, uh, you know, what your Twitter handle is. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you can find me at, at Turnstone Capper. I, you know, I'm from Syracuse. You know, I live in the Syracuse area. I'll probably always call it the Carrier Dome. I'll probably always call X Twitter. I just can't get used to calling it X. Um, thank you so much for Nick Greeley for joining. That was our SoCon preview. Please like and subscribe to the Wager Talk YouTube channel so we can keep bringing you these free previews. And uh, we'll have about six or seven more. Uh, there's already three of them up, so um, probably 10 or 11 in total throughout conference tournament week. Uh, so keep an eye out for additional previews. Uh, and follow me on Twitter, at TopFlightSI.